Ready? Are we ready? <laughs> We're on the unit. Here we go. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Welcome Cheers. back to, oh, you got the wine. You can get us on. <clears throat> Welcome to Fork Mike Knife, Season 2, Episode 6. Uh, if this is your first time at Fork Mike Knife, you can find um, six episodes from Season 1, plus the other five episodes from this season on our website, which is bunceroo.com, and then under events, uh, scroll down to Fork Mike Knife. So this week, um, we celebrated our anniversary yesterday, <laughs> 15 years. Um, it was a lot of fun. We renewed our vows on the beach. We live here in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, so we took advantage of that early in the morning before the crowds hit for the holiday. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, but we did some pre-planning and uh, getting ready for today, and we are very excited to welcome. We are excited to welcome Andrea Nardello. Uh, so let's bring Andrea in, and then we'll talk a little bit more about it. Hey. There we Hello. are. Hi. Hello. How are you, Andrea? Andrea is your outside Philadelphia, right? Yes, right outside, 20 minutes in South Jersey. Um, we've known Andrea, I just looked, since 2014. Oh, wow. Uh, I think you played every single off the record festival that we did. I'm pretty sure. Aww. I think so. <laughs> yeah. That was and a lot of fun. At Rock by the Sea two years ago, we got to meet Anna, your wife, mm -hmm. uh, and that was a treat. Uh, I know she's in the back. <laughs> Come around. <laughs> cheers, Andy. Well, cheers to the both of you. Uh, happy anniversary, and thank, thank you for letting us celebrate with you. We wish we could have been there in person. Aww. Well, we're really excited for this recipe today. We did catch your little bit of a video earlier. Uh, got very hungry, had to eat some lunch even before getting ready for this. <laughs> Understood. That's how Italians do it. eat all day long. Yeah. So the way this goes is we always ask uh, our guests to pick a dish that uh, they want to make for us today. So, Andrea, what did you pick and why? I picked uh, my mom's meatball recipe. Uh, which will go, we call gravy. Uh, a lot of people think uh, marinara sauce, uh, but we called it gravy growing up. Um, and then creamy polenta. And why? Um, I think because, you know, the pandemic has forced us to get creative in the kitchen. Um, food has always been a big part of my life and my family and the way to show love and feel good and um, there's also a lot of different things that you can do with both of these dishes after the fact. So, figure why not? Mom is watching today, hopefully. Hi, Mom. You, if she figured out how to get on the Facebook live stream, she is watching from the Jersey Shore. I text awesome. her. And I awesome. Awesome. Perfect. <laughs> well, there's, there's just nothing better than family recipes. I mean, yes. we tend to just pick up a cookbook if there's something we're looking for in particular, and then we twist it around to make it our own. Um, but I come from a, a very Southern family, so I totally get you call it gravy and you call it um, polenta. Typically, we would be doing shrimp and grits with yeah. chatter. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, everything just kind of crosses over no matter what, whether it's music or food. So very excited to see how this recipe goes today. And, and thank you and your mom for sharing it with us. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I had to check with her before giving this out. <laughs> You get the thumbs up. Got the thumbs up. Is, are there <laughs> NDAs involved, or <laughs> do we need to sign? <laughs> What'd you say? Do we need to sign anything? Is there an NDA? No, no, no NDAs. <laughs> this is this is now a public recipe. <laughs> well, it. thanks for making it a first here. So the first thing I thought of um, as soon as you said marinara with um, meatballs is making some fresh homemade pasta. So that's something. Uh, that we do a lot. Um, it is not as hard as you would think. So um, we're going to make some fresh pasta today. Uh, and then um, our basil plants in the garden, we have three basil plants and they are going nuts. Um, our garden is um, kind of in the shade. And so um, that works perfect for basil. Uh, and so we have a lot of basil. And um, so we thought we'd, we'd make some, some fresh basil. Um, one of the things, what? Oh, fresh, pesto. fresh, <laughs> fresh pesto. Our director is looking at us. Over there. <laughs> what are you talking about? 
fresh pesto with the basil, right? Yes. Um, I like, um, and actually for dinner tonight, we're gonna, um, with our fresh pasta, we're gonna make a red sauce, Cheryl's uh, version of marinara, and then a dollop of pesto uh, on top of that. Mm. So I don't see any reason why you can't combine a red sauce and uh, a, a pesto. It's sort of like gravy and mashed potatoes. You know, you can put them together. <laughs> I feel like Italian food is meant to be mixed and mashed. It's, it's just a beautiful thing. Yeah, we agree. Awesome. We agree. So should we start with the meatballs? You want to kick things off? Yeah, or let's start, let's start with the meatballs. Maybe a little libation that you're enjoying? Oh, yes. So um, we kept with the Italian theme and went with a Santa Margarita Rosé. A um, little bit of bubbly to celebrate with you two. Yeah, thank you. The so cheers. If anybody else is at home um, and wants to crack open a box, <laughs> Sunday fun day is the way to go. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you can just read what it is. You do it. Oh. Dark clothes um, yeah, so you know, obviously um, we've got an Italian wine here. It comes in somewhat of a magnum style, which is nice. Um, yeah, the um, Governo is um, a Tuscan style wine. And what makes it unique is um, they take some of the grapes uh, and they let them dry out first. Um, and that intensifies the flavor, the flavor uh, of this wine. So um, we just opened it uh, not too long ago. Yeah. And it's lovely. Great. We yeah, cannot wait for dinner. So we're going to only drink what we have, <laughs> and then we're going to leave it corked. <laughs> All right. Are you ready to start? I am ready. Okay. We're going right. to shoot it over to you. All right. So um, the first thing that's usually unusual that a lot of people don't realize with my mom's meatballs, because they, whatever they eat it, they love it, and they think it tastes great, but they don't understand that it's actually ground turkey and it's not meat. It's not beef. Um, so I got a pound of, uh, ground turkey right here. I got some fresh parsley. Um, yeah, definitely use ground turkey with some fat. Um, I just think it has more flavor and it's juicy. Um, so the thing about my mom was that we always had food in the house. Like it was just, we cooked, we had long dinners together. Um, we had parties for everything. Um, my mom would feed an army uh, constantly, whether it was my family or my friends. Um, and I think meatballs and gravy is something that you can do and feed a lot of people in an inexpensive way, but it's also just really delicious. And like Bill said, lots of times, it's a lot easier than you think it is to make this kind of stuff. So I'm gonna teach you how to do it. Um, so I would say this is, this is the other thing about Italian recipes. We don't write anything down. We just, <laughs> we just kind of know, um, and have a feel for it. So this is about two handfuls of parsley. I don't know if that's a, a measure. Um, uh, and then we are going to mince up some garlic. I got two knives here. I like fresh garlic. Um, my mom used to use a lot of dried spices. And again, because she had to feed me and my brothers. Um, and when you're cooking for a large amount of people, it's easier to keep dry ingredients in the pantry. Um, but if you can figure out a way to get some fresh stuff, I think it uh, just enhances the flavor. Um, the, the other interesting thing about recipes is the difference between my grandmother's meatballs and my mom's meatballs and my meatballs, because none of them are the same. Um, I don't know why that is, because we've all watched each other make it, but it's just not the same. Um, I've taken to not cooking my sauce as long as uh, my mom did, because I like a little bit more of a tomato flavor. Um, you get like a really rich meat flavor in the sauce when you let it cook for a long time. Um, I need to be Now, I'm not big on gadgets in the kitchen. <laughs> that is a fact about me. I think most things you can do with your hands and a knife, but the one gadget that I truly believe in is a garlic press. So you shove it in there, it's 
squeeze it out and you get that nice fresh garlic that's minced. Don't buy the garlic that's in a jar that's minced. That stuff's weird. I don't think it tastes good. I think it tastes processed. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to tell you that your way is the wrong way. I'm just going to show you the right way to do it. <laughs> So get the garlic in there, all the juices, all the good stuff, keep that over top. And then another key ingredient, which my mom swears by, and I actually agree with her, is the Italian seasoned breadcrumbs. Um, reason being, they just they smell good, they have more flavor. Um, again, I'm really sorry. I tried to write down a recipe, but it's just a sh couple shakes. I think it's about a half a cup. That's kind of how we roll. Um, the other key ingredient, so we'll do a little bit of Parmesan cheese because I think every Italian dish has Parmesan cheese. Again, a couple shakes. It's about half a cup. Now, this is the secret to the recipe. Egg beaters. I don't know why I've made these meatballs with eggs. They just don't come out as juicy. So, a little pour, about a half cup, roughly. The next part is very critical. I'm gonna probably need you if my hands get messy. This is where you use your hands. There's no other substitute for feeling the meat. Uh, eventually, yeah. So mix the meat, get in there, don't be shy, get a good fist. Um, when we were younger, uh, my mom would have a bowl probably like this big with probably like four pounds of meat in it. You can, the thing that's nice about this too, is that you can make these meatballs and you can, uh, freeze them. And so it's a nice way to just have something in the fridge to, to reheat. So now this is the other key. And again, you have to do this. You have to smell the meatballs. <laughs> you have to be able to smell the garlic. You have to be able to smell the cheese. You have to be able to smell the ingredients past the meat. Otherwise, you didn't put enough of something in there. So it's always good to have a helper. Can I get the pan to maybe spray some Pam on that? It's always good to have a helper nearby because your hands are disgusting. Um, I washed mine before I started doing this, but uh, they're pretty gross. I'm going to make tiny meatballs. Or tinier meatballs than I would normally make because we're going to do like a low pan sauce on the stove because I want you guys to see what uh, what happens. Some people like to measure it with like a, a measuring cup. Just get in there, get dirty. Play with your food. Usually the rule of thumb is a pound of ground beef or a pound of ground turkey will yield 10 to 12 meatballs. Oh, there you are, Cheryl. Hi, just wanted to pop in because this looks really amazing. First of all, smelling that, absolutely. You've got to right? make sure. So I like that you mentioned that. I also like the versatility in the choice of meat. You know, we've always typically done the veal and, and beef kind of blend, um, but I just love, love the ability to use, um, you know, a lighter protein, so that's very cool. Um, you mentioned measuring. I may have this thing about things looking exactly the same, <laughs> and I found that those um, cookie scoops are mm -hmm. perfect. So they come out similarly all the time. But you're like this, a symmetrical person. Everything needs yeah, to be. Yeah, <laughs> just a little, just a little. And we are getting some really fun comments about. Sunday gravy day. They are now quoting what you said about um, the meatballs in particular. Uh, so we're gonna have some fun, I think, hashtags coming out of this one. Oh, good, I like it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, back to you. So um, it's funny that you said that you used to do the lamb and the veal because uh, I, right before lockdown happened, um, there's always that one oddball that is uh, either really, really big or really, really small. So you just deal with it. Um, right before lockdown happened, we had our friends over and I made like a big Italian feast. And Annie is getting better at it, being adventurous with the food that she likes and tries to taste. Um, there's certain things she absolutely won't eat. Veal and lamb is, is 
two of them. Um, but my other friends that were actually with us will eat anything like me. And so I experimented with this recipe with a lamb and veal mixture and it was dynamite. So I feel like just like art, just like music, just like food, it's subjective and it's your preference. So if you want to change the recipe and try something different, go for it. Um, and that's, I think the beauty of all the things that we do and how it connects us. So I'm going to wash my hands now and get these in the oven. Okay. Are you back on? Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> Andrea, how about we um, make a little bit of pasta? Yeah, go for it, man. Okay, cool. Um, oh, that's one of all right, well, let's talk about pasta. Follow me this way. Um, there's a bunch of different ways to make um, pasta. Um, this is a recipe that um, I've settled on. It works for me. It works great. Um, I was taught how to make pasta, uh, you know, making a, a small bowl uh, with the um, flour uh, and then using a fork to whisk it all together. Um, this recipe, we're going to use the food processor. It just is easier. Um, we're using, um, well, I'll take it out of the bag. We're using double zero flour. Um, it just works every time. So this is what this brand looks like. Um, look for the double zero uh, on the bag. It's uh, obviously finer ground uh, flour than, say, all-purpose flour. Um, we use it not only for pasta, always for pasta, 100% double zero flour for our pizza recipe um, for the pizza dough. Um, we'll use half double zero, half um, all purpose flour. Uh, so maybe on another episode, we'll do some pizza. Uh, and so today um, for this pasta, what we've got is uh, a cup and a quarter of double zero. So I measured that out already. It's here. We're going to put it into a food processor. Uh, and then in this bowl, I've got three egg yolks. I'm going to add to that. Uh, this is three tablespoons of water, one tablespoon olive oil. And just for fun, uh, you don't have to add this. I have pistachio paste. So pistachio paste, uh, it looks, actually it looks a little bit gross, but it's like, has the consistency of uh, peanut butter or almond butter. So I've got my measuring spoon here. Uh, so I've got a tablespoon of pistachio paste. I think almond butter would be great. Uh, it just adds a little bit of nuttiness. Um, this brand I bought on Amazon, of course, uh, and I pretty much only use it to make this pasta with. So we're making some pistachio pasta. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to whip these things together. We've got the water, the oil, three egg yolks. And most of what I'm trying to do is just to break up that pistachio paste. All right. It's watery because uh, of the water. Um, and now we've got nothing but cup and a quarter double zero flour. I'm going to put it on low. And this is the part that just makes this so easy um, is now we're just going to drizzle this in. Come in here, pop in there. And I'm going to go ahead and take some plastic wrap because what we're going to do next is we're going to turn it into a ball and we're going to put it into the refrigerator for half an hour. So get it off our blade here and it's been mixed up pretty well. 
going to dump it out on our plastic wrap. Make sure we get everything. There's going to be a little bit of flour that didn't get incorporated. That's fine. All right. Now, I wouldn't say I'm going to need it, but I'm just going to kind of push it all together and make sure that it gets mixed together. When it sits in the fridge for a half an hour, that liquid, that liquid from the egg yolk as well as the water and the olive oil is going to distribute amongst the flour. All right, try and get it off my hands. Close enough. Bring it together. Nice and tight. All right, it looks kind of dry, but you'll see. I'll pull some out in a bit that we made earlier today. Uh, and it's all come together uh, in about half an hour in the fridge. Um, yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> uh, back to you, Andrew. So I love making fresh pasta. Um, that's actually something I really uh, tried to experiment with my mom. Uh, we bought a pasta maker and we did the seven fishes. One, I think it was either Christmas or Thanksgiving. And I finally realized that the easiest way to do it is either just in a bowl, the, you know, the old fashioned way. Um, and I've never tried the food processor, so I might, I might try that, Phil. Um, Cause I love, nothing beats fresh pasta. Um, we might be able to turn on the, uh, the pot can. Um, cause I think we need to get the polenta going. Is that possible? Um, can you turn my mic on? Um, it went away. I think maybe your screensaver came on. Oh no. Well, then what we can do is we'll come over here. We'll switch, switch position. Sounds good. Oh, you want to know why? Because the temperature's too hot. <laughs> uh oh. That is one thing we did not test out. That's all <laughs> we We were so excited to have. We have a pop can. <laughs> okay. Now we know that that. Uh, now we know that the temperature is too hot to yeah. effectively do the uh, the pot can. All right, That's so funny. <laughs> we'll we'll okay. we'll do an overhead shot once we get the polenta going. But um, so I grew up eating um, cream of wheat, and uh, I just love you know that that grit or that polenta. It's just I don't know. It's comforting to me, and I feel like it's really versatile. So. Um, we've been using it a lot for a lot of different uh recipes while we've been on lockdown and uh it's been really really great so once you bring the water to a boil some recipes call for three parts liquid to one part um cornmeal or polenta or grit but i choose four parts i don't know why i don't really have logic behind it i just prefer the way it cooks so I got four cups of water in this pot. And we're gonna do a cup of polenta. And the key, so I've heard, is to um, pour it in slowly while the water's boiling and then whisk while you're pouring it in slowly so it doesn't clump. I'll be the first to admit when I was younger and my mom would make cream of wheat for uh, breakfast. I actually liked when it clumped. Uh, but polenta is a different beast. So we're going to pour this in slowly. We discovered that uh, after you make polenta, if you put it in a flat sheet pan or Tupperware container and let it uh, cool, the next day you can use your air fryer and cut it into squares and make polenta fries, which is some of the most delicious 
things and bites of heaven I've ever eaten. So you bring that to a boil, you whisk it in, and then you turn it down to a simmer. I call these medium bubbles. So I'm going to take the phone and show you since we, we toasted our pot can. These are medium bubbles to me. I feel like that's kind of the nice consistency. I always thought that you have to stand here and just constantly whisk um, the polenta, but you don't. You can actually put a lid on it and let it kind of simmer and then stir it occasionally, which is nice. Hey, Andrew? Yeah. So do you keep it at medium bubble the whole? I do, actually. I, I tested this. Um, yesterday actually because i this is i can make the meatballs in my sleep um but the polenta is not a recipe that i have like done so many times that i don't even think about it um so i kind of leave it at this at this boil with the lid on and then stir it occasionally and it works cool cool i grew up on cream of wheat too so totally understand <laughs> what you're talking about now i've never heard of uh pistachio paste so you you taught me something today that's actually that sounds delicious and i think i'm gonna try it Ask him which brand. <laughs> yeah what what brand is that or did he make it oh my gosh. which one the uh the pistachio paste oh, oh yeah is get the brand of it there you go. Really? yeah maybe watch this one. it's uh fitting at farms pistachio okay. paste and like we he said he he got it on Amazon and really, you know, we tried making pistachio pasta ourselves just by using the food processor or our coffee grinder to get those nuts really fine. Yeah. And we found we just couldn't get it fine enough. Um, and what then happened is the first time we ever did that without using this paste, uh, everything we got hung up because the grains were too thick. Ah, uh, broke. We actually broke the pasta maker. <laughs> this is how we learn. Yeah, it is. This is how we learn. I know. Now I don't know if we've ever talked about this, but did you know that I spent 15 years in the restaurant business? No, I don't think so. How did we not talk about that before? I don't know how we didn't talk about this because Bill, <laughs> Bill's like a proper chef, right? Well, yes, he is certified. I did go to culinary school. Yep. <laughs> Yep, I spent, uh, I think before I was even legally allowed to, to work, I was uh, slinging Swedish fish at my um, local swim club. And I just wanted, I wanted to feed people. I wanted to be like a part of the, the party. I just, I've always gravitated towards the industry of entertaining, whether it's through food or music. It's been, uh, it's been a passion of mine. Well, you, you do it very well on both sides. <laughs> All right, we'll let you get back to it. All right. You want me to, uh, you want to make um, pesto? We could make the pesto. It's up to you where you are in uh, the next step for the polenta. So it's pretty boring to just sit here and stare at the uh, polenta while we stir. Um, so if right. you guys want to crack that, uh, that pesto, I think by that point, the meatballs will be ready to go into the sauce. Perfect. Awesome. Awesome. I'm going to do the nuts. Yeah. <clears throat> so one of the things we were talking about earlier today um, with our friend Jen, who was here, we were talking about um, the versatility of pasta. So traditional, pe not pasta, pesto. Traditional pesto uh, is with um, pine nuts, uh, which is what we have today, um, which tastes great. They have a very unique flavor. Pine nuts are super expensive. Um, you can absolutely substitute walnuts. Um, pecans, you could do pecans anything. would be good. Depending yeah. on how you want the sweetness level or acidity, just depends. Yeah, exactly. Um, but we happen to have some pine nuts, so um, we're going to do pine nuts. Um, one of the things that I think is important is um, in order to intensify the nuttiness of the pine nuts, um, we always toast them first. So uh, dry pan, no oil in there. Um, probably 60 seconds, maybe a little bit longer than that. You just want to watch for a tiny bit of color. And I say that because there are many times that I have yeah. just taken my eye off of it. 
for literally seconds and come back and well they went right in the trash <laughs> yeah they're easy to burn uh, and usually you're just step away for a few minutes. It's as simple as that. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about the rest of it here. So um, recipe wise, we've got two cups of basil. We mentioned that um, uh, we've got three um, basil plants out in the garden. Um, so Cheryl went out this morning and picked this fresh basil. Um, real quickly, I'll talk about cleaning basil. Um, we obviously live at the beach. so. It, when it came inside, it came with a lot of uh, sand on it. So fill up a bowl with a nice cold water, drop all your basil into it, and then pick the basil straight up out of the water and you'll see the sand and dirt will be left behind. Uh, I like that a lot better than the spinning um, things that you are used to clean lettuces yeah. and so on. Um, once um, you've cleaned it, um, what we generally do is wrap it in a, um, in a wet paper towel like this um, just roll it up like we just had it and then pop it in the fridge uh, and it'll stay nice and fresh for a couple days in the fridge um, two cups basil um, we have a uh, half a cup of olive oil we've got some uh, fresh parmesan that's half a cup of uh, parmesan actually one third cup parmesan i'll post the actual recipe um, and then we like a little um, little zest, a little um, acid to it. So we've got half a lemon we're going to squeeze into it. Got to make sure that you add some salt. We're going to add some pepper. Uh, and then we've got three, four uh, cloves of, of garlic. Yeah, perfect. There's our toasted. And you, you can really smell that toasted pine nuts now. Um, you'll see that they start to look like they're wet. So the oil that's inside are going to come out. So the reason we take it out of the pan um, is because your pan is hot and it will continue cooking. So in order to have that time between they're done, don't let them go any further and actually getting it to the food processor, you wanna make sure that you're allowing it to sit outside of the pan and that way it doesn't continue browning. All right. Um, pesto is pretty straight, pretty easy to make. We're just gonna put everything in our food processor and turn it on until it mixes up. So we'll go with our two cups of basil. Two cups of basil. Yeah, and just a side note, you know, pesto is one of those things that's really versatile. This is a pesto version, I mean, a um, basil version of pesto. You absolutely could use alternative greens. You could use parsley, you could use spinach, um, whatever you really enjoy from a taste profile um, and still get that same great uh, sauce for pasta or, I mean, we even use it in our muffalettas. Uh, we usually use an olive tepanade on the bottom and a homemade pesto on the top and then you stuff it with whatever. Um, so it, it can be used for quite a few things. Just a little bit of lemon juice. And then finally our olive oil. Got everything in all at once. Pulse it up. Gonna pause it, push everything down. Oh, smells delicious. Cup of pine nuts on the side there. <laughs> <laughs> I'll eat those later. One last time. We're almost there. No, I think it's fine. Awesome. Just get it all incorporated. All right. Take that. Now we've got, got our pesto. Put that in the fridge, let it cool off before we use it. Fresh made pasta, pesto. Mmm. 
Bill, I might need a, a refresher on how to keep Basil alive because we have <laughs> we have two black thumbs in this family. <laughs> My so dad used I, to have a gorgeous garden, and I, they did not pass that gene down to me at all. <laughs> I do think the important thing for basil is not direct sun. So okay. our garden, it has, it has some morning sun, but it gets shade all afternoon. Uh, and I think that makes a big difference. Um, tomato plants, lots of sun. Basil, not so much. So that's been working for us. We had plenty <laughs> of things that didn't make it. We made some, what well, we tried to grow purple cauliflower. <laughs> I don't know what we got, but it was not cauliflower. It was a decorative plant. Yeah. <laughs> so. All right. Thank you, Andrea. All right. So I'm gonna since we since we destroyed the pot cam. Um, actually, we're gonna try this. Just for the the sake of trying it. So. Um, all right. Enter. All right. Even if it's only on for a little bit, we got the pot cam. So the other key thing about polenta that I learned after cooking it a couple times is, is you, have you have to, to let, let it sit. sit. All right. I muted it, so that should be fine. When you let it sit and it's covered, it, um, I don't know, I guess like it just absorbs the moisture a little bit more and it thickens up. And then, especially when, at least for me, when you're making creamy polenta, then when you add the wet ingredients, it doesn't make it so like soupy that it's too wet. So I let this, we, we boiled it for about five minutes um, on that medium simmer and, or until the moisture and the liquid is absorbed into the polenta. Um, and then what I have here for the sauce is we chose Cento today. Um, it's a 28 ounce can of whole peeled tomatoes and then two cans of tomato sauce. And so what that does is just gives you a little bit of meatiness with the tomatoes and then it gives you enough sauce to cover the meatballs when you're cooking it together. So I'm going to get the meatballs out of the oven. I'm going to put them in the sauce. One thing different that I did here is my mom usually would take all of these ingredients, garlic, um, and, uh, and put it in a blender and blend it all up so the sauce was very smooth. Um, and I chose not to do that today because we're trying something different. Um, so I'm going to move the polenta. We're going to put this bad boy on the pot can. And hope that my phone doesn't fall into it. But hey, that's the price you pay for art. So we're letting that kind of simmer. I'm going to pull the meatballs out. And then we got other stuff that we're gonna add. All right, here's the meatballs. I'm gonna put them under the pot can. I wrote this in my recipe, but when you start to see the kind of moisture come out, you know it's like really starting to cook. And that's when they can go into the sauce. Um, some people like to saute their meatballs in like a cast iron skillet and get that like nice brown coating. All right, this is also a key thing in the kitchen. You gotta have a lot of tongs. <laughs> <laughs> I just, uh, so the, the brown part, that's like that nice like crust that you get um, on, the, uh, on the meatball when you do this. So we're gonna toss this in the sauce. If you want more char on your on your meatballs, then put them in a, in a cast iron skillet or put them in a saute pan and sear them on all sides and you get that nice like crust oh, on the outside. The Say what? You can also turn them while they're in the Yeah, you can turn them. I, I feel like my uh, my mom did a lot of things that you could like leave for a little while um, and not worry about it because when you're cooking for a mass amount of people, um, you don't want to sit there and babysit things. Oh, I love that the pot cam's actually working. All right, so we're putting the balls in the sauce. Looking awesome. Love the pot cam. I love the pot cam. I'm so excited. We had one Hashtag, sticky hashtag, hashtag pot cam. <laughs> hashtag pot cam. Note so, to self, now we need an oven cam. <laughs> 
We will definitely have an oven cam. Now, I don't think I can put my iPhone in the oven. That's probably not going to work. <laughs> yeah, I think that temperature thing would come back into play. Yes. Exactly, exactly. Well, I have a feeling we're going to lose the pot cam at some point because it's just going to uh, fry again, and that's okay. So this is another scenario where I don't really remember my mom ever giving me, like, actual measurements of what to put in the sauce. Um, so we just kind of estimate. What's the equivalent of handful with tomato sauce? <laughs> you ready? I'll show you. <laughs> this is a handful. Layer it on top. There you go. <laughs> but seriously though, this is what my mom like. When, so I lived in Atlanta for a little while and I would call my mom. This is when I was working in the restaurant industry and I would ask her to walk me through all these recipes. And these are the things that she would say to me, my grandmom too. And they would say like, oh, just cover the pot with the herb. And that has no measurement. It's just kind of a gesture. Um, then we got some fresh basil. Again, it's all preference. Um, you can ship and odd this if you want to be fancy. I like big whole leaves because they melt into the pot. Looking good. That's just crazy good. Right? All right, Fresh well, herbs. Bring away. I happen to have an Andrea Nardello video. Should we go to that for a minute? I will never be upset to watch this video. <laughs> All right, here we go. Every day has led us to today. Pain, I love, and fear, hopes, our dreams. Was long and hard, it made us strong. Now it's time to let our love come shining in. Cause when you know, you know, we decide to let it go. Put our past to a box under the bed. We will spend our time making love, drinking wine. Raise our kids, share a life of love that's kind. You'll be mine. It's funny how this life of ours turned out. It's nice to love without the blinding doubt. Wildflowers by the road, we can watch our family grow. Take our time So hold me now Do my love, I promise you I will Love you more Cause when you know, you know We decide to let it go But our past to a box under the bed We will spend our time Making love, drinking wine Raise our kids, share a life Love that I know we have a time limit on those So, uh, hold on, I gotta turn my volume down Awesome, anything you wanna tell us about that song, Andrew? You know, um, I actually, I haven't recorded that song yet. Um, and I wrote it for a friend of mine who got married um, recently um, for the second time. And I feel like um, for anybody that gets married and, and falls in love, and there's always this um, moment where you may want to doubt that feeling, um, but the, the cliche of when you know, you know, is actually a real thing that happens. It's just very obvious. Um, and I felt like since this was your anniversary weekend, um, I love that you love each other so well and thought it would be appropriate to share this song with everybody that's listening and you. Um, so hopefully once quarantine is done, I'll be able to record this and put it out into the world and everybody can share their love. Oh, it's awesome. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you. That's beautiful. Now
Um, should we roll out the pasta while that simmers? You good? Absolutely, yeah. I'm just gonna, um, while that simmers, I'll, I'll finish off the, the polenta after you guys do the pasta. Hey, Marguerite, uh, hey, I wanted to say that Margarita uh, is joined us and she is like, okay, meatballs get in my belly. But my <laughs> actually said that a handful equals a half a cup. So there you go. It depends on the size of your hand, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, All right. I got some. I got some on hand. <laughs> All right, quarter cup. Quarter cup. <laughs> it's fine. Uh, all right, Andrea, I'm going to take you out. We'll leave the pot can in <laughs> nice. while it's simmering. And we'll go roll out our pasta. All right. Okay. I'm going to need your help. All right. Uh, all right. So um, we made our pasta. We put it in the fridge for at least half an hour. Obviously, you can, you can let it sit for a day or so. Uh, but we're just going to take it from the, the plastic. And if you could feel it, it is so soft. So it's relaxed. We also see that the liquid from the uh, eggs and the olive oil and the water has distributed. And I'm going to go ahead and cut it into four equal sizes, four equal pieces. I'm going to roll that back up. Let Cheryl roll it back up. And then um, could you roll this out by hand um, with a rolling pin the way they do in Italy? Absolutely. Um, that's hard to do, um, but um, I have a KitchenAid uh, that has the pasta attachment to it. I used to have one that had the roller as well as the cutter to make linguine or spaghetti all in one. That one was convenient. Cheryl pointed out before I broke it um, with big pieces of pistachio. Uh, and so I went out very quickly one day uh, and bought this one. It works great, but it's actually two different pieces. So this is the roller. And I'm using linguine today, so this is going to be the linguine cutter. Um, but we'll go ahead and we're going to roll this. I'm going to turn it on. Yeah, sorry for the noise. Turn it on pretty slowly. Uh, the other thing, the way these work is there's some numbers on the left-hand side here. You start on one, and I think it goes up to eight. Uh, and what that does is make these rollers get tighter and tighter and tighter. So the first thing we're going to do... Just start on one, um, get it, you know, fairly thin to go through on one. And we're just going to feed it through. And for the first couple times, I'm just going to fold it back and forth on itself. Um, and then I'm going to put it through this way. Fold it on itself, put it through again. And it's pretty well mixed together at this point. Now I'm gonna start cranking it down from one to two. We're gonna make our way all the way to eight. Well, maybe not, maybe seven. Seven can sometimes be thin enough. Three. You can see already it's getting thinner and thinner, bigger and bigger, longer and longer. No jokes there. <laughs> All right, we're on five. All right. Seven. I went straight to seven. We're going to stop at seven. This is going to be thin enough. You going to hold it? I'll hold it. Oh, I sure. sure. Yeah. All right. And turn it off. Now to perfect world, what we would probably do is we could let that dry. You, I've seen people hang it on like a, um, a drying rack. Yeah, and you can actually, at this point, cut this into pieces for uh, lasagna if you choose. Or Ooh, if you want to make ravioli, this is the perfect time to do that. Um, that'll be a different episode. <laughs> All right, so now we have our cutter. Take it back. 
<laughs> we'll do it after I get it off. Sure. And the weenie. Okay. All right, two more steps. It's kind of long to work with that way. So we have our kitchen grade scissors here that are clean, cut them in half. And then what Cheryl's doing now is drop here. I'll hold these. Okay. Um, what do you have in there? So this is a mixture of all purpose flour and cornmeal. And what you're looking to do is get this coated uh, because we actually consider this a portion, um, you know, the both halves could be one. It just depends on how you're serving, if it's an appetizer or, or a uh, main. And you just want to knock off some of that. Scoop it up. And it'll keep it from sticking together when you put it in the pot. So we just kind of portion ours this way. Now that cornmeal, when you drop it in the pot, is, um, is going to fall off and fall to the bottom of your pot. But that will keep it nice and dry. Um, we're not going to cook this for a couple hours. So in the restaurant, um, we would portion uh, just like this, uh, keep it in the cornmeal, keep it in a dry place until we're ready to use it several hours from now. Yep. And then the last thing I'll say is um, you get your uh, pot of salted water uh, roaring, uh, boiling. And when you drop this fresh pasta in, it's not going to take longer than... Um, Three minutes tops. It, really what you need to do is to, as soon as it comes to the surface, it's basically done. Fresh pasta cooks so quick and it just depends. Maybe you made it a little thicker than we did, you know, so it could take a little more time. So anywhere from 90 seconds to three minutes will do it. Just watch for it to float. Um, grab that um, strainer. Slider? Yeah. So you may have seen cooking shows. They call this a, you know, a strainer or... Uh, a spider, and you'll see it a lot when you do fried foods and things like that. We like to scoop out the pasta this way, but we also, our pasta pan has an internal strainer, so you can just lift the center up. Just depends on how you do it and what you have available. Cool. Thanks. Just bring Andrea back in? Yes, please. <laughs> now I'm hungry. I switched, <laughs> I know. There she is. <laughs> I switched the pot <laughs> can. So... <laughs> Back to the podcast. Yeah. I'm, I'm so hungry. Um, <laughs> we are too for very different reasons. <laughs> I know. And tell tell Margarita that she's only a couple hours away and ah. she, can, she can have these meatballs. And we're drinking Santa Margarita. We are drinking Santa Whoa, Margarita. Well, there you go. So, all right. The, the meatballs and the gravy are simmering. My stove is so stubborn. And we're going to finish off the polenta now. So basically, um, again, I'm a big believer in taste the food, figure out what it needs, and adjust. So we're going to add some salt. I think I said two tablespoons, a couple pinches. I forget what I wrote in the recipe, but, you know, make, make an adjustment. And then butter always makes things better. That's two heaping tablespoons of her weird fake butter that she likes. That's all right. Annie likes it too when she doesn't know what's in it. A little splash of whatever kind of milk you can tolerate. I think we lost the Ooh. can. You want this? Yeah. Another gadget that I firmly believe in. No, thank you. Um, cheese graters. Uh, there is something really magical that happens when you actually grate the cheese fresh. <laughs> it is. It's. I love food. I love to eat. My favorite memories growing up are with my family at a table eating. I have a photo of my grandfather where he actually fell asleep at the Thanksgiving table because we ate so much. He just got tired and fell asleep. <laughs> um, 
my grandma, no matter what you were doing, when she would see you, you looked hungry. Um, <laughs> Tilly was a little shorter than me, maybe like 90 pounds, and just always wanted to feed you. My mom's the same way, you know, I think just Italians come from a place of feeding you and taking care of you is the way that we show our love. So um, that was just what you expected when you came to my house. So I remember when we were kids, you know, parties were always a blast. And then when we got older, we would literally come home if we were hanging out with my friends, we'd come home and whatever leftovers were in the fridge, we would just open the fridge, it would be like two in the morning, and we would just put the spread on the kitchen counter and just eat for hours. So I just feel like food is always with me um, throughout my life. And Andrea? Yeah. I do believe that um, we are related somehow. Um, <laughs> We were talking over the weekend and I would come home from school, you know, four o'clock in the afternoon as a young kid. And with an, an hour, there'd be 40 relatives in the house and we'd be eating homemade chicken and noodles or cabbage rolls, whatever. I don't know how my mom did it. It was pure magic. Yep. Whatever was in the house, she turned into this spread. And, you know, it just was about family and food. So I, I think we're related. It's, it's, I, I feel like the best way that you can get to know somebody is to break bread with them. Absolutely. And the best way you can take care of somebody is to feed them. Yep. And so my, my family taught me that, you know, um, and it's, it, I just, I've always loved food and the social aspect of it. And it's just, it's a, it's a great way to show your love. Um, and also Absolutely. feed your belly. Yeah. Well, when we were at Rock by the Sea and we were doing a, a special meal for the artists, um, there was no doubt in my mind that at some point we would be in a kitchen together. Uh, given the, the day and time that we're living in, a remote is just fine. Um, yeah. But we were looking forward to having you and Annie come down so that we can do this in, in real time. Without a doubt, that is going to happen. And I actually think that was the first time that we, I mean, I've, I've tasted your food before, but that was the first time that we spent like, a lot of time together. You had, you made blends of that weekend. You made grits. Uh, yes. grits. We did. We did the cheese grits. Oh, yes. we was, was it, and it was Parmesan grits. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was a lot of fun. And the kale salad, I remember, we noshed yeah. on all of it for the whole week. Yeah. Um, it was nonstop. <laughs> it was nonstop food. And I remember, because I, I watched Paul's episode and I remember the cocktail that you made. Yeah. Um, it had, it was a take on the basil. Yeah. Was it mezcal? Yeah, it was mezcal. The basil. <laughs> it was a lot of, a lot of margarita. Smacking. Yeah, it was the margarita. Yeah. Poblano, yeah. cilantro, mint. margarita. Mint. It was mint on top of the margarita. That's what that oh, was. Oh, you mean down there? Yeah, down there. Okay. She had, yeah. she's had a poblano margarita. She was talking about Paul's episode. Oh, yeah. where we made it on that. Yes. yes. I was back in the Rock by the Sea because we did <laughs> oh. the, the, the drinks that had the mint that we were banging our hands together on. <laughs> Either way, it's a beautiful thing to share with all of you. Now, Annie's going to do the taste tester on the polenta. All righty. Can we uh, put it in a bowl? Is it ready to serve up a serving? So this is the other thing that Italians do. We eat out of the big dish. Yeah. <laughs> we double dip also. Oh, because nobody's Perfect. coming over, so it's fine. But do you oh. use your fingers or do you only use utensils? So with hot things, use utensils. Yeah. With other things, use your hands. We call it eating the profits. Yep, oh. absolutely. So the one thing that you could always guarantee was that me and my dad and my brothers would be hovering over my mom while she's cooking chicken cutlets or eggplant, <laughs> whatever it was. <laughs> and we would just be like behind our like hoovers, just grabbing whatever was coming out of the kitchen to, to taste before she was even done. And that was just what we did. <laughs> yeah. So I 
think we're ready to serve. All right, let's I'm do good. it. I think we're ready to serve. Andy didn't give me any uh, negative feedback on the polenta, so. So good. No, that's good. That's good. You serve it up. Let's see what it looks like um, as if you were putting it in front of us for the evening. All right. Let's do it. Let's do the presentation. So coming from, a, and then the blue for the, well, actually, no, we'll do this. Coming from the restaurant experience, um, there were two things that stuck with me for my entire life. In college, I worked, actually, let me take this. In college, I worked at a place called Mario's Fishbowl in West Virginia at WU. Okay. It's a hole in the wall bar, but the chef and the Italian woman that worked there uh, had a binder full of recipes. And everything that they made was from scratch. So that's how I learned to make most of my like go-to recipes. <laughs> We would order bread fresh every day. She was serious. And, and if you screwed up would her recipes. Would she hand you one of her recipes to make? What's that? Would she hand you one of her recipes to make? Oh, yeah. She she had a whole binder and, oh, and just awesome. gave us all. We did chili. We did dressings. We did wing sauce. We did Rubens. We did, you know, everything you could think of that would, like, a college kid want to eat when they're drunk. But it was all made from scratch, and it was delicious. That's and awesome. then the... The second level of restaurant experience that I had that stuck with me forever was in Atlanta. I worked for the Buckhead Life Group, and there was a place called Nava, and it was the number four restaurant at the time. Wow. Southwestern Cuisine. Kevin Rathbun was the head chef, and it taught me everything about customer service, fine dining, wine. Every day we would go to work, they would put all of the specials on the plate um, at the counter. We would all taste it. They would let us know what the ingredients were. So you had duck, lamb, venison, tamales, just all sorts of really crazy flavors together. And then the wine reps and the liquor reps would come in and they would give you a Añejo, which was a aged tequila and really wow. delicious Spanish wines. It was just one of the best experiences I ever had because um, it taught me a lot about food and service and how to um, elevate everything that we do. So this uh, is uh, in a, for me, cooking in a, in a commercial kitchen in a restaurant taught me a lot about patience. It's like you put it in a pan, don't touch it. Not yet, <laughs> not yet, not yet. Now, <laughs> especially things like mushrooms, Cheryl knows. Don't touch the mushrooms. <laughs> what are you let doing? Them, let them cook. Everybody wants to touch the food. Just let it sit. Yeah, I I agree on the patience front, but I also, I have to say this, because if I don't say this, I'm going to be really sad, especially now that, like, restaurant people can't, or most restaurant people can't uh, work right now, or if they right. do, it's, it's forced to, like, take out or, um, you know, uh, outdoor seating only. Um, restaurants are extremely difficult and servers don't make a lot of money if you don't tip so tip oh, right. Annie's, yep. Annie's helping me I've had too much rosé <laughs> um tipping oh, is probably the one thing down because <laughs> our monitor is down I'm here like, that's amazing, amazing. right so oh. some fresh herbs on top of that uh, so as I say in the Italian. Let's get the light. Let's get the that's brilliant. Annie, come here. Yes, baby. Hold this. Hey, so yeah. That's so I say, awesome. I say to you, good. from my oh. family to yours, we oh. love you. Manja. Well, we, Manja. Cannot, we cannot tell you how much we appreciate it. And and I know you have teed up um, just a magnificent thing that some people may not have seen. Um, you teed us up for a brilliant video on our way out today. Can you just go ahead and give the audience a bit of info about it? Yes. So I won the opportunity to sing with Brandi Carlisle and her band. And it was at her all-woman festival in Mexico. It was one of the greatest things I've ever done. 
and we put together a little hit reel from front to ending so that you guys can get a little taste of one of the best things that I've ever done um, yeah. and most exciting things. Well, thank you, awesome. Annie. Thank you, Andrea. Love to you. Love you, guys. Love you, guys. Love you so Bye. much. Here comes the video. Yeah. All right, you're obviously a badass. <laughs> so I'm gonna get ready to bring my A game here. All right.